So my name is Donna Gustafson. I'm uh, the chief curator at the Zimmerle Art Museum. Uh, this is my colleague, Jerry Began, who is a professor in the Department of Design at Mason Gross School of the Arts here at Rutgers. And together, we are the curators of the Angela Davis exhibition, which is on view in what we call our special exhibitions gallery. Um, so Jerry and I, uh, you know, are delighted to be here today. We are very excited by uh, the guests and panelists that um, we'll be speaking today. It promises to be a very interesting, stimulating, and I think dynamic conversation. Um, and we are starting it off by showing a, a video um, interview with Angela Davis that was recorded in 2019 um, by a team at the Oakland Museum of Art um, in collaboration with us and our exhibition. And I should say parenthetically that the Angela Davis Sees the Time exhibition will close here on uh, June 15th and will then travel to the Oakland Museum in Oakland, California, which we're very excited about. Um, so we're going to show that video here. And we also have Maureen Kelleher um, here. She is the co-director of the Social Justice Quilts Project, which is on view in the Zimmerly Art Museum's Macaver Gallery. Maureen is going to be um, in the gallery uh, talking about the quilts, talking about the project. Uh, she's been working with a group of incarcerated men who have been creating quilts, and we have a gorgeous, very beautiful display of, a, of some of those quilts up in the gallery. So if anyone would like to hear Maureen speak about those quilts now, um, she's going to be going over there. And that's one option. The second option is to stay here and watch the Angela Davis video. Um, so is there anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just very briefly. Um, so I think the, the slide here sort of says, says it all. We have. Uh, Erica Huggins on the left and Angela Davis on the right. And in the middle, we have a poster that was made when they were both imprisoned, uh, aiming to, to free them all. Free our black sisters, free Erica Huggins, Angela Davis, and free all political prisoners. So that's what the basis of our discussion here today. Um, this is, this is the, the program, but I think everyone has got a copy of the program, so I won't go through it. Uh, so, but we'll be showing, first of all, this, this interview that we made for the exhibition with Angela Davis here, and then, as, as Donna said, Maureen will be up in the uh, quilts, and then we will have uh, our keynote speech uh, by uh, Dr. Kenyatta Taylor um, at one. One thing that Angela Davis said when she came here, was she pointed to one of the posters upstairs, and she pointed out that Rochelle McGee is, who is her co-defendant, is still in prison. He's the, he is the, at 52 years in prison, he's the longest serving political prisoner, I think, in the world. And so the QR code will take you to uh, a site where you can sign the petition uh, and get involved around uh, Rochelle McGee's um, freedom at long last. Okay, so I think we, we could show that, uh, video now, uh, and Maureen, I think, has already gone up to the galleries, and so here we go. So um, thank you. That's, it's such a fantastic video. I love watching it every time. And now I'd like to introduce the, the new director of the Zimmerly Art Museum, Maura Riley. Welcome, welcome. God, to follow up after that, what does one say, right? One of the most articulate thinkers of today. I'm just constantly inspired by her brilliance, and I've seen this a few times. So, listen, thank you for coming to the Zimmerly. As Donna said, I'm the new director here. Um, and I want to start this program today by acknowledging the, the Lenny Lenape people as the traditional owners of the land upon which we we sit and speak and, and engage today. And I'd like to ask that we all please pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to all indigenous peoples worldwide who continually struggle with genocide and erasure, and who, second to African Americans, 
are the largest group per capita in the United States prison system. Today, I'm delighted to welcome you to this extraordinary program, amazing lineup of speakers, which all celebrate Angela Davis's anti-carceral activism. Now, the program, as I think you know, welcomes New Jersey's leading anti-carceral activists, as well as con contributions from survivors of incarceration and scholars about continuing Davis's struggle for justice and, and freedom in the state. So I hope all of you will take time to visit the exhibition, if you haven't already, uh, the Angela Davis sees the time co-curated by Dr. Donna Gustafson and, and Jerry Began. And please also visit Stitching Time if you haven't. Those are the social justice quilts Maureen Kelleher was associated with. There's also a beautiful exhibition of drawings uh, by Mark Lofney up off the lobby there. Now, these exhibitions, like the discussion today, raise questions about social justice incarceration, freedom, and the necessity to speak out and to speak up. I'd also like to thank our sponsors for this event, New Jersey STEP, which is the New Jersey Scholarship and Transformative Education in Prisons Consortium at Rutgers University. Thank you for co-sponsoring this with us. Now, I'm honored to introduce to you today for the afternoon's events, Nafisa Goldsmith, so please thank Join me in welcoming her to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. That was rather heavy, would you say? Right? That was a way to start off an event. Uh, when I think about Angela, I automatically think of one word and that's icon. We are blessed to have Angela amongst us today, to still be able to learn from her and to be able to learn from her movement, her personal movement. And so today we get the opportunity to look at a collection, a vast collection of a history from 1969 to 1972 when we're talking about a woman, a black woman, an educator, who's fighting for her life and what that looks like, all I can just say is powerful. And so today we will have the opportunity to engage in a powerful conversation. And, and I would like to say that it is an honor uh, to be here and to be able to introduce um, our next speaker, and, and we're going to have a discussion. And um, the discussion is, is going to tap into the movement and what that means uh, to us today, uh, how we define it, how has history uh, taught us uh, lessons of survival through the movement. A, revo a revolution is a serious thing. It is the most serious part of a revolutionary's life. When one chooses to commit to the struggle, it is for a lifetime, Angela Davis. And so I would like to have a discussion, if we can bring up uh, two chairs there for me. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce to you all Dr. Kianga Yamada Taylor. Uh, she writes and speaks on black politics, social movements, and racial inequalities in the United States. I have been asked to keep her expansive bio short and sweet. Uh, and, and you'll understand why uh, once we engage in this conversation, but she is the author of Race for Profit, How Banks and the Real Estate Industry Undermine Black Home Ownership. Uh, she is a scholar and she is also uh, a professor at Princeton University. And when you talk about movement, and Black Lives Matters and the LGBTQ and you talk about purpose in the movement. We are talking about Dr. Taylor. So please join me.
Thank you. Thank you. Can you introduce yourself? I am Nafisa Goldsmith Suleimani. Um, I am a uh, Rutgers alum, uh, also a Douglas woman. I am a Mountain View community uh, alum as well. I am just uh, really honored to be here because what we're talking about today is not only Angela Davis and you know just her work, but we're also going to talk about how her work has influenced the work that Dr. Taylor is doing, as well as you know myself and the panelists that you'll be listening to uh, later on. We will uh, dive into that. So that's me. I'm not into the long introductions and all of that good stuff, but I'm just the person who's like overly excited and humbled to be here today. So. <laughs> cool. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you guys for um, coming. I'm super honored to. Uh, uh, to be here. There, I had a little bit of confusion um, when Jerry reached out to me. Uh, I do a lot of uh, talks and the fake conversations, which are really like uh, the new word for interview. <laughs> um, so I thought that this was a one of these cu curated conversations and not um, a keynote. But in many ways, I think that um, this, this is better. Uh, just I think in the spirit of uh, Angela Davis, who kind of issues the uh, hyper focus on the individual um, and the importance of collectivity, especially in thinking that, um, I don't know, this seems more, uh, more fitting. Although I could talk about Angela ad nauseum, but you know. Why not? Yeah, why not? You know, you have to seize the time. <laughs> So um, I, I think just to, just to get things started, um, one of the, the reasons um, that I think uh, Davis is, uh, is interesting is when we think about um, the black movement of the, the 1960s, um, in many ways it's a very uh, male space. Um, and even as, uh, Davis is uh, clearly known and I think today revered um, that it's still almost seen outside of the context of, uh, of that movement. Um, and so, you know, I'm a historian and I teach uh, about uh, the civil rights movement and um, the black liberation uh, era of the 1960s and 70s. And there's actually very little written uh, about Angela Davis. Um, she's kind of always included as because of the significance of the campaign to free her. Um, but outside of her own autobiography, uh, there is actually not much written um, about uh, her politics, uh, her political role in um, the movement. But I think importantly, some of her observations um, as a participant, uh, and namely, um, you know, one of them is, it has to do with the kind of uh, pervasive atmosphere of uh, sexism um, in the movement, which I think contributes to, um, in, in many ways, her marginalization uh, within that history. I think the fact that she was a communist, um, that uh, she was a black woman, and that she uh, was a prisoner um, has made her uh, not part of the kind of urge within American national narratives that tend to uh, um, focus on progress, uh, that uh, like to uh, default to idolatry, um, that like to create heroes uh, out of personalities. And Angela Davis doesn't necessarily um, or really at all fit into that. Um, and part of, you know, part of that has to do with her uh, political past, but I think it, it's also because of the way that um, she has, her ideas have evolved, of course, but that she has maintained the core um, of her politics, uh, which is, you know, a rejection of capitalism, 
Um, and you know, it's different manifestations, particularly the criminal justice system. Uh, and her continued commitment to uh, the ideas that we need radical social transformation. Um, and so she doesn't fit, she's not dead, so they can't rewrite her history, right? Um, and as a living kind of link between those two periods, um, she's remained incredibly consistent. So she also doesn't fit uh, into the kind of neat narrative arc uh, that our uh, uh, official bodies of history uh, like to contort uh, and simplify very complicated um, uh, narratives. And so I think that is, for me, one of the reasons why um, Davis remains a, a kind of interesting, mm -hmm. um, but also important figure. I, I'm listening to you, and I'm thinking to myself about um, Angela, and when she began to really pay attention to what was going on inside the prisons. Uh, prior to that, her work was around you know, freeing political prisoners, but not so much of the prisons itself. And Angela says how it wasn't until, you know, um, Rochelle McGee started talking about uh, slaves of the state and she began to understand, wait a minute, the slavery is equivalent to prisoner. And where do we go from there? And then tying it into women, incarcerated women until she herself experienced what it was like, that wasn't something that sparked mm -hmm. anything for her. And so she credits uh, Rochelle for that. And I think about prisoners, and I think about brilliance. And when we just pay attention here to these these photos, uh, and, and they're also on display. And so they're of different jails. And you see the lights, right? And so this one here, the first one is from a distance, but this is, this is a jail. And I remember when I did my walkthrough and uh, Jerry and I, we were, we were talking and he was saying what he, what he got from it and all I could think about was those lights all representing brilliance of the individuals who are captured inside. The most brilliant people are locked behind walls. And so it was someone who was behind the wall who sparked something for Angela. And that something is a part of why we are all here now. And so I, I'm curious to know, what was it about Angela that sparked that something in you for us to be having this conversation now? That's an interesting question. Um, I think I... I discovered Angela Davis in uh, um, different phases uh, of my life. Um, the first uh, was when I was, um, I was very young. Um, and, you know, my mother, um, like uh, thousands of other black women in the 1970s, um, you know, grew her afro out three feet tall. Um, like and, a lot of mothers. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, part of that um, uh, was solidarity uh, with, with Angela Davis, um, uh, but also something, something more than that. Um, I think that uh, Davis is, you know, I, I know that she and I uh, appreciate this kind of cringes at the idea of her as, a, uh, as an icon. And I know that, that people invoke that um, as a sign of, of respect uh, for her. Um, but I think that she always wants to see herself um, as part of something and not um, kind of standing uh, outside of that. And, you know, I think that the, the way in which um, black women um, uh, took on her, uh, uh, her hairstyle um, 
and black people embraced her uh, was not because they saw her as completely different outside of uh, themselves, outside of our struggle, but that um, in many ways she represented the best of that. Uh, and I think that was because of her uh, enormous courage um, and bravery, which is different from fearlessness. Uh, one of the things that um, she just released uh, the, uh, a third edition of her um, autobiography um, by uh, Haymarket Books um, earlier this year. And, you know, one of the things that I think is, is really interesting uh, about this new edition um, is the cover itself. So there's the edition from um, uh, 1974, 1978, where uh, the cover is almost like this kind of socialist realism where Angela Davis is looking into the light, uh, looking completely uh, confident and self-assured um, uh, on the march uh, to victory. Um, and this cover, uh, the, with the new book, Angela is kind of crouched and s not slumped over, but looks unsure, um, and mostly looks exhausted. Mm. And I think that that um, is actually more representative of her experience uh, during that period. And so it is bravery, it's courage, um, but she's an actual person, and she is tired from the uh, relentlessness of the state during that period. Uh, to um, uh, even before she was implicated in anything, just the, the constant harassment. I mean, one of the things that I have um, read recently was uh, uh, some of the FBI reports um, about uh, Davis. And there's this one in particular where uh, one of the things that the FBI was doing when uh, Davis came out as uh, a communist in 1969 uh, when she was a professor at the University of California, uh, Los Angeles, UCLA. Um, one of the, the ways the FBI was trying to disrupt uh, her um, being on campus was uh, they had agents write letters uh, to the newspaper in the names of black people, right? So the agent would be Leroy Brown. Um, uh, writing a letter that uh, complained that he knew personally that Angela Davis uh, was a whore and that she liked to sleep with married men. Um, and so imagine like that level of uh, harassment um, when people inquired about uh, her being in possession of guns, uh, Angela Davis received thousands of uh, death threats and hate mail, uh, and her, um, you know, her life was put in peril uh, in part because of the uh, attempts of the state uh, to undermine um, her position. And so this was before um, uh, she was jailed, before she went underground. Uh, and so that, you know, I think that there was an enormous amount of uh, goodwill and solidarity uh, that um, was directed uh, at uh, Angela Davis. And that was certainly uh, evident to me at a very um, early age uh, with uh, my mom, who's not, um, would not describe herself as a political person. Uh, she came of age um, during the civil rights movement in Nashville, um, Tennessee, but, uh, was not involved in politics in a way that my uh, father was, who was, you know, conversely, um, kind of less, uh, I think, interested in the experiences of uh, Angela Davis because of esoteric uh, complaints with the politics of the Communist Party uh, compared to his own ideas about what was necessary for um, black people to actually achieve uh, to actually achieve liberation. Um, 
just a, the I know that was a really long answer, but the 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 second thing um, and the the last thing I will say about this is, um, so that that's when I was younger. I read Angela Davis's uh, uh, autobiography um, when I was in high school, when I was sixteen, um, and I thought it was interesting, but. Not, I think maybe because I myself was uh, a political person. Um, I had joined a socialist group when I was 14 and then again when I was 16. And so her experiences weren't um, particularly novel to me because I had had those experiences um, myself. Uh, but I, I think there's something about the, um, I think the older that I have gotten and the consistency, not in term, not rigidity, because her ideas have evolved and they have changed, um, but I think the, her commitment, uh, as I said before, to the kind of core essence uh, of them, uh, which is a, a real rejection of the status quo that exists in this society and a willingness to uh, be immersed in that. And so she's not a talking head. Um, she is, I, I think one of the things that has been underestimated um, about the longevity of interest in Angela Davis is that, uh, and she's often not discussed in this way, that she has been an incredibly important public intellectual uh, someone who uh, popularizes, uh, explains um, uh, what could be considered complicated uh, ideas about uh, social theory or political theory uh, in ways that ordinary people can make use of. Uh, her autobiography is, is an example of that, that which she described as a political uh, autobiography, meaning that it's not necessarily about the minutia of her personal life, um, but it, she really sees it as uh, an important part of understanding her relationship uh, to social movements uh, as um, uh, an important, his at this point, a piece of history that explains something about the black movement, uh, but I think can also be seen as an entry point um, for ordinary people into politics and organizing because she sees herself uh, as, 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 part of that, um, as part of that process. Uh, so I think, you know, that um, uh, the autobiography represents an aspect of that, but women, race, and class mm -hmm. as well um, as, as a way to uh, really popularize not just the politics of uh, feminism, uh, but their relationship uh, to uh, racism uh, and to class oppression. And that Toni Morrison um, edits the autobiography and edits women, race, and class is indicative of Angela Davis saw herself talking uh, to a broad audience um, and that this was not just a, uh, uh, even though um, she is or was an academic. These were not academic exercises. So this is really a, a life of, of struggle, a life dedicated uh, to struggle. And that, that is something admirable um, in a society that um, makes that really hard to do for someone who has reached uh, a certain level of um, uh, social popularity, right? It would be very easy um, for Angela Davis to, uh, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, to sell the rights of her personal story to some horrible Hollywood house. I mean, it's pretty remarkable that no one has made a movie uh, about her, you know, her life. If you've read the autobiography, I mean, this, this is uh, the stuff of, you know, uh, Hollywood movies uh, with, if you extract the politics from it. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and she hasn't done that in a society that commodifies personalities and that, that fetishizes individualism. Um, uh, 
you know, she has, has uh, resisted that and maintained her uh, commitment to, um, to politics and to organizing. The, you know, her whole uh, after prison life, you know, of, of uh, dedicating herself to, uh, to organizing and to taking on the, the issues of, um, of uh, mass incarceration in the United States, this, you know, this is admirable. Does she know a little something about Angela? <laughs> right? Okay. Uh, I can just sit here and listen to you because the historian in you is teaching the student in me. And um, well, I am curious about how you uh, came to across Angela? Angela Davis. Yeah. Oh, man, a little girl watching uh, news clippings, mm. you know, um, and watching this woman with this crown, okay, uh, step into a courtroom with such confidence. Nobody can strut like Angela did in that courtroom. And she had the know-how that by raising her fist, she was making a statement. That was just brilliant to me as a little girl uh, growing up and a little light skinned girl mm -hmm. and a little light skinned girl who had you know a gap between her teeth and I'm, I'm seeing a woman who who reflects that right and and I'm, I'm seeing this woman different from other women uh, that I saw uh, growing up around that time uh, prior to really paying attention to Angela I was in love with uh, Claire Huxtable and to me this is still a real person this is not just a a character, <laughs> you know, on the Cosby Show. No, that that uh -huh. was a real person, and, and mm -hmm. I wanted to be uh, like her. So the power of uh, that woman is, is what really captured me at a very young age, and I did not um, really get into understanding who she is until I was incarcerated. So when she talks about how prisons and the conditions of prisons did not even it wasn't a thing for her until you know she herself became incarcerated until a prisoner you know uh pointed it out to her and um so you know being in, in incarcerated and reading you know her books i'm like you know this is beyond just strutting into a courtroom right this is understanding that there is an education that teaches you mm. the mm -hmm. movement right mm -hmm. um and and so um from there, I had the blessing of becoming a Mountain View uh, student. And uh, I, I remember when I was uh, living in Highland Park, I, I stumbled across a bus uh, on Livingston campus, and they were headed to Columbia University, and I was invited uh, to, to jump on with them, and they were going to Beyond the Bars. Mm. And um, I'm like, Kathy Boudin. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. who, who's, you know, what, what are we doing here? And I'm just on the bus, and they're like, we're going to see Angela Davis, and Angela, what? Mm -hmm. Okay, I wasn't ready. And, and so I'm there, and I remember I was taking photos, and I'm, I'm just trying to get closer to her. I'm like, I'm in, I'm in space. I want to feel this energy. This is not the book. This mm -hmm. is not the person on TV. This is, I'm in the same room as she. And um, as uh, connections and relationships would have it, uh, someone who I had met uh, through one of our panelists, uh, Boris Franklin, uh, Dr. Uh, Johanna Fernandez, was actually mm. there with Angela. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw her and she says, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I kind of came. And she says, well, wait for me. I have to get Angela's food. <laughs> Whose food? Uh, and, and so I, I, I found myself in Angela's green room uh, eating hummus with her. Mm -hmm. You know, she's a vegan. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then I was invited to the after event where I got a chance to drink a little wine with, with, with Angela. And, and uh, have deeper conversation and, and just marvel uh, at the woman in the moment. Um, so that was the first time That's I amazing. met her and, and then I got a chance to 
meet with her and be on Zoom calls, mm -hmm. you know, with, with her. Um, and so I was introduced to Angela at a very important time in my life mm. because I was able to look at examples and compare. And um, I had always said you, that I wanted that? to, I was able to look at examples of black women mm. and compare at, a, at an early age. Uh, my uh, very early examples were not the examples that you would want your little girl to follow. Um, we're talking about um, examples that represent uh, domestic abuses. We're talking about examples of, you know, um, allowing yourself to become a victim of the system that has constantly oppressed you. That that's a line there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, sometimes we choose the oppression that we suffer from, and and so those were like my examples, mm -hmm. and and so to see a uh, Angela Davis or to see a Claire Huxtable, um, it gave me something to compare and, and something to aspire to. And so um, I can say that uh, I am very grateful mm -hmm. that we, we had a woman who had to deal with uh, fighting for her life to bring us here uh, now because I'm quite sure that she did not think that what she was going through would have affected the generations uh, that it has. And um, I'm just like uh, thinking, and I wanna ask you, uh, when, when we talk about the movement, and this is something that I think mm -hmm. that we need to be honest about, you know, we, we hear that word and it's thrown around so much, you know, the movement, or we're a part of a movement, or what is a true movement and not only that, have we, has it become commercial? Is it cliche? You know, uh, is it a movement or is it a moment? And I, I think that we need to, to, to talk about that because moving forward, as we move forward and we have new people with, with new visions, uh, you know, Angela did talk about relationship and she talked about how we can shape, you know, generations four or five, six, seven generations ahead now before they even get here. So when I think about, you know, uh, your work, and I say, wow, that's a movement all in itself, <laughs> right? And, and I think about the work of, you know, our panelists when you get to hear them, you know, they're, they're a part of something. Mm -hmm. But is it a movement or is it just a moment? And we're calling it a movement and, um, so I'm just curious. Well, about I think that. it's more than a moment because this year is the you know 10th anniversary of the murder of Trayvon Martin, mm -hmm. um, and so you know before that time and uh, in this concentrated period of the last um, 10 years, uh, there have been <coughs> different efforts um, that have looked more like a movement at some times. Uh, less at others, um, but I think, you know, if, if uh, I think if we, you know, think about this as um, both the <laughs> desire from millions of people to see things differently um, in, this, in this country, even if everyone is not always sure what to do to make that happen, um, that, you know, we have been in fits and starts of, of movement over, uh, over the last decade. Um, and I, you know, I think that's important. And I think that the events in the summer uh, of 2020 um, were undoubtedly uh, what a social movement looks like. The, the thing is, though, is that no movement um, survives just because it should. Uh, it shouldn't, it doesn't survive or, or continue uh, just because the issue from which it arose to confront um, uh, has been resolved. You know, if it hasn't been resolved, the, the movement doesn't necessarily uh, continue um, even still. I think social movements uh, require, you know, some combination of 
uh, ingenuity, luck, um, in order to, uh, to actually accomplish what its goals are. Um, and so to that end, you know, I think that uh, this movement around black lives uh, is a little bit at a crossroads, um, uh, coming out of the kind of enormous uh, energy that the New York Times said that somewhere between 15 and 26 million people participated in demonstrations in the summer of 2020, that there were more than 5,000 uh, protests uh, during that time, um, that a lot of that got corralled into the presidential election and then the Georgia Senate races shortly thereafter. Um, and it's been unclear what to do since then. Um, so one of the, the interesting things to think about with Davis um, is uh, the experiences of the, the black liberation movement in the, in the late 1960s, because um, in many ways, I, I think that there are uh, continuities um, and breaks, changes uh, from then to now um, that are important and mean that these two eras uh, in some ways are connected uh, to each other. Uh, I think the big issue is that the lack of resolution uh, to the core issues that the black liberation movement mobilized itself around, um, uh, were not resolved, right? So those issues that, uh, if you look at the Black Panther Party's 10 point um, program, uh, that in many ways, even though that was specific to the Black Panther Party, really captured uh, the political mood um, of uh, black America uh, at the time, which is why, of course, the FBI was so single-mindedly intent on destroying the Black Panther Party, uh, that those issues of uh, against police brutality, for uh, the uh, social provision uh, of basic needs, um, has not been realized. Uh, um, uh, and in fact, there's a, a relationship between its lack of realization and the exponential growth of the prison industrial complex and mass incarceration uh, in the decades after. Um, that the refusal to attend to um, the social needs of poor and working class people uh, created the conditions for uh, a um, escalation of uh, a regime of law and order uh, and uh, the, the use of, of crime as uh, really an excuse to um, attack and undermine uh, communities and also um, uh, imprison a, a, a small but significant portion um, of the population. It's not a conspiracy. Uh, it's actually, you know, uh, a part of, of uh, a part of what happened, um, and so there are uh, continuities that get then expressed in um, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, the movement for Black Lives. Like the discussion about defunding uh, the police is ultimately a discussion about the need for the redistribution. Uh, of resources. Uh, it is an observation uh, that simply continuing to punish people, to police people, uh, uh, to incarcerate people doesn't actually attend to uh, the social uh, aspects of why violence and harm may exist in a community uh, in the first place. Um, and so the demand to defund uh, the police, which was panned and distorted by liberals and conservatives alike, uh, it was really about um, uh, taking money that is overwhelmingly invested in police um, and putting those in uh, public services and institutions uh, that people believe uh, would actually do more to address issues of harm and violence than simply incarcerating and locking people up. And that is a clear uh, uh, um, continuity from the end of the 1960s, the early 1970s, uh, and today. What I think is most fundamentally uh, different, and there are other uh, 
questions about how do we do that organization. Uh, I think that some of the, uh, the, the problems with organization during that period um, often get overlooked, right? So there's a, a, a focus, almost a myopia, on the role of um, uh, the state uh, and the FBI and the attempts to disrupt uh, black uh, radical organizations, uh, which is true um, and well documented, uh, but we also have to look at the internal strife uh, uh, between and amid, amongst those organizations that also contributed uh, to their ineffectiveness, ultimately to their ineffectiveness. I mean, this is part of the, the brilliant insight um, of uh, Angela Davis's autobiography um, uh, about the kind of internecine uh, conflict uh, amongst these groups, which also contribute uh, to uh, politically undermining uh, them. Um, and I think that uh, activists today uh, have drawn some negative lessons about what it means to be in an organization, uh, what it means uh, to be a part of an organization that has led them to uh, embrace what uh, people in Black Lives Matter have called a leaderful uh, strategy, which sounds good, but really is an evasion uh, of responsibility and accountability. You can say that there are no leaders that exist, but ultimately, someone makes a decision about something. And so the question is, will that person be held to account for that decision uh, or not? And in order to be held accountable, you need clearly defined, uh, uh, accountable, accessible um, uh, leadership. And so that is a, uh, uh, a kind of continuity as well. But the thing that I think that is radically different um, are, is the wider kind of social context within which this is uh, happening. By the end of the 1960s, there was, even with the, the existence of these radical organizations and, and movements um, of which Angela Davis was uh, connected, you could still make an argument uh, that black people had largely been excluded uh, from seats of power, uh, from the governing institutions, from economic, political, social institutions. Um, and that actually, if black people were included, um, that perhaps it could look different. Uh, you could be cynical about that argument, but there was a space to make that argument because of the extent to which African Americans have been excluded from the formal seats uh, of power. And so that's why you see uh, a kind of entry into the Democratic Party, an entry into uh, the realm of formal politics. By the 1980s, you get the kind of uh, wave of black elected officials, black mayors, uh, the beginnings of, of uh, the, the Congressional Black Caucus in the 1970s, uh, black congressional uh, representation that accelerate, you know, through into the 21st century, where today we have uh, the largest number of black uh, 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 congressional representatives in American history. We, of course, had uh, the first black president, um, two terms of that, the black attorney, a black attorney uh, general. And it, I think in the, the summer of 2020, you saw the dynamic of black elected officials, black police, black police chiefs, uh, uh, all involved in trying to suppress a black rebellion uh, led by uh, young black people. Um, and that is a dynamic that did not exist um, uh, in the, the late 1960s and 1970s, uh, which is different and adds a new dimension, I think, to, uh, uh, to the struggle that I think requires um, thinking about what that means. Um, yeah, I, I'm glad that you mentioned this new dimension. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned accountability. And I know that our time is yeah. ticking. Um, and I would love to go on in this conversation <laughs> because you actually. Clearly I would too. Yeah, because, because you actually hit on a few things. And I'm like, oh, yes. Uh, let, let's dig into that. 
but uh, we, we don't have the time. But when you talk about the inner turmoils that happen, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in, inside these uh, organizations, it is crucial um, that um, those of us who are organizers and who are all fighting for the liberation of, of all, right, um, to not have these conflicts because that's how you destroy the movement. That's how you can get in there and... Um, well, you're going to have conflict. I mean, yeah. that, that's I the mean, thing. But the, the conflicts that disrupt, the conflicts that cause uh, society or the communities to suffer, right? And, and this goes into the who is the leader or, right. or, or wanting to be that person out front and not allowing everyone else around right. you to, to, to help and, and assist. And so you, you have to create the conditions where the conflict can be engaged. Right. I mean, if you think that we can just vote our way out of this, that's one thing. If you think that we need a radical transformation of capitalism, that's an, that, these are different ideas that have a hard time just peacefully coexisting. Mm -hmm with each other. So the question is, how do we create the, the conditions to engage that discussion, which may result in saying, we can't actually be in a group together. We might be able to fight around this one specific thing together mm -hmm. in a campaign, in a coalition, but we can't actually be, and, and that is a conclusion that some, people, uh, that some people come to, but the problem now is that there is no means by which to engage the many different ideas people have about what it means to be liberated or to engage in politics. And that is what we, that is what we need, is more discussion, more thought, more collaboration, um, uh, and not less. I think that's the best way to end <laughs> it. Right there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. This was such an amazing conversation. Um, I was just wondering, um, and I don't think this, I don't know if this is a question for now or if it's a question for later for the panel, but looking at Davis, uh, you know, in the film mm -hmm. and Dr. Taylor listening to you talking about the very last point actually that you made about movements, I'm wondering about the issue of the longevity of Davis um, and the benefit we have of the longevity of Angela Davis and looking at our panelists who themselves are activists. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about longevity, about survival as a leader, survival as an activist, um, mm -hmm. both in terms of personal integrity, <laughs> you know, personal survival, but also as political survival. Like, how do you stay relevant? How do you make sure that you're not um, coalescing around one particular thing that has a sort of short lifespan, but to continue the constant struggle without killing yourself in the process? <laughs> I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Uh, that's That's, that's a Thank great you. question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I listened to, um, I was listening to a, an interview with uh, Angela Davis. Um, uh, I mean, I listen to these things all the time, but um, a couple of days ago, and, you know, someone asked her about self-care. Um, and so she cringed at the question, you know, because it's, it's like one of, uh, these kinds of manifestations of um, individualism on the, on the one hand, you know, that seems particular and peculiar uh, to our society. Like, how do you take care uh, of yourself? Um, and yet, you know, she wanted to honor the spirit of the question, which is really about, um, or some aspect of it is about, uh, what do you do about burnout? Um, how do you, preserve yourself for uh, a long struggle. And for her, and I, you know, I tend to think this is true, um, that it's about um, being a part of something, being a part of a collective, uh, of a community, um, avoiding the, the symptom of martyrdom, uh, that somehow uh, you and your own special unique way uh, are the one that can uh, resolve um, these issues, but that uh, being a part of a, a of a community or a collective um, on some level means that you entrust other people uh, to partake in this project with goodwill, 
um, that you uh, uh, have political trust um, and uh, a sense of comradeship uh, with with a uh, a broader milieu of of people. And I think that when you're engaged in a in a project like that, uh, it means that you can retreat. You know that you can um, take some time off. You know uh, that you don't feel this kind of moralistic obligation that somehow your particular presence uh, is the key to resolving these historic problems. Um, and you know, of course, the presence of some people is uh, is critical um, and may matter more than the presence of others. Uh, but um, I think the bigger point uh, was that we will resolve these issues or we'll fail in these issues, um, but it has to be a collective endeavor. And that is, to me, what is most um, frustrating and tragic about what we are seeing uh, uh, today is that that sense of collective um, ownership um, and collective responsibility uh, has been so deeply uh, frayed. Um, and you see the kind of celebration um, uh, of individuals and individuals who in, indulge that uh, and in, engage in that, and um, you know, it's it's a problem that that really um, that has to be addressed. And I, you know, I think that ultimately uh, it will be addressed. I don't know if it'll be resolved, but I think that you know, you get to a point where um, that particular approach um, is is not sustainable. And I think that we are actually reaching uh, that point because of all of the effort and energy um, to think from 2020 to now is a tragedy, right? Like that was an enormous opportunity um, and it's been frittered away. And so we have to, we can't give up, you know, but we have to uh, deal with the, the realities of that and shift course. When you say democracy. scaffolding, well, when I say democracy of the world, like Victor Orban, who recently, yeah, you know, was reelected. I mean, I feel like you know uh, Brazil. I can't remember the president's name here, but I feel like some of the things that are happening are because we are losing sort of that orderly that we've had that wasn't necessarily um, orderly, but these governments were powerful. And I mean, I think. We, we live in a, a deeply undemocratic and unequal world. And, you know, in, in this country, it's, it's particularly profound. Anytime you come out of uh, <laughs> a historic uh, pandemic where the richest people have uh, doubled their wealth, and, you know, from hundreds of billions to trillions, uh, you know that there is probably something fundamentally wrong with the society. Uh, itself, the the Supreme Court uh, leakage, um, the fact that there is a monarchical body of unelected wealthy people that get to decide and determine the fate of 300 plus million people is an absurdity. It is a complete absurdity, and you know here we are. And so, um, I think that does that uh, impact 
you know, social movements, I, I think that, yes, in some ways it, it does, and the way that it does is, uh, it comes back to this debate over how do we achieve social change. And I think in 2020, um, the most prominent leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement made a gamble that if they, um, uh, if, if, if they partnered with the Democratic Party, that it would give them a seat at the table um, in a Biden administration, uh, and they would uh, get to shape policy. And in some ways, it wasn't a crazy idea. Uh, the Democratic National Convention um, was advertising Black Lives Matter protests and uh, uh, websites and, and ideas. And the fact that they were actually engaging um, uh, um, activists meant that people, you know, believed this to be true. Um, but the reality was much more uh, was much more complicated. And so, you know, we that debate and the lack of engagement with it within the movement. Um, uh, you know, is part of what has set us back. Unfortunately, everyone, that's going to end our questions. Um, but thank, thank you. you. Thank you again. Thank you again, Dr. Taylor. Hello, everyone. We'd like to welcome you back, and we'd like to start our panel. Once again, my name is Nafisa Goldsmith. I am the Senior Criminal Legal Fellow for Salvation and Social Justice. I am also a organizer. Um, and so to be able to panel, uh, to moderate this uh, discussion, I am like really excited and I am like sitting amongst the people who not only I get to work with, but who I get to learn from. And so um, I just hope that you all can um, take away uh, some great uh, information and insights uh, from this uh, discussion. And we will open up for a question and answer uh, shortly after. And so what I initially wanted to do was to be able to introduce each one of our panelists by, uh, you know, just reading off their bios. But something tells me that I'm going to let these individuals speak for themselves. And, um, I think that's the best way to do a proper introduction. And, and so I want to start off with uh, my brother, uh, Dr. Russell Owen. Uh, please introduce yourself, sir. Um, hello, everyone. It's just a pleasure to be here. Um, I think I'll just start off by saying that I served 32 years in carceral spaces in New Jersey. Um, and I've been home for eight months now. And uh, just my testimony is that every day is a gift. You know, um, I was able to become, you know, by the grace of God, uh, everything while I was inside those carceral spaces. You know, um, so I was able to come home, right, uh, with a good education, right? Not just a good education, but an education that would allow me, you know, just to, you know, um, be a part of this movement and to contribute to it. You know, so currently, you know, I live in Camden. You know, I work in Philly. I'm also an organizer, and I organize out of Monmouth County with New Jersey together. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, okay. Well, there isn't enough. What, there isn't enough mics for everybody. So this would be the community mic. <laughs> Um, uh, Charles Boyer, Salvation and Social Justice. Um, I'm blessed to be, um, let, let me say this because I want to eat good tonight. <laughs> um, my greatest privilege is being the husband of Rosalie Boyer who's yes. right there. Um, yeah, pr <laughs> proudly the pastor of Greater Mount Zion African Methodist Episcopal Church in the city of Trenton. And I mention that as way of uh, my engagement in this work has everything to do with my religion. Uh, African Methodism was born out of abolition. And as I 
am third generation in this religion. Uh, despite that lineage, I don't think I really came to a full realization of what the religion was about uh, until my seminary days. Uh, my seminary days coming through an African Methodist Episcopal Seminary uh, gave me the privilege and the call and the responsibility to continue in that tradition of abolition. And it was there that I had to ask myself the question, what is the slavery of our day? And it became very clear what the work was and what it was about. And it's from answering that question uh, that Salvation and Social Justice was born uh, and that a ministry about the liberation of black people and the fight to liberate black bodies uh, was, was, was born. And so that's my, uh, that's my bio. Uh, um, I'm Amos Cayley. I'm a pastor uh, at the Reformed Church of Highland Park. Um, I'm also uh, here representing Salvation and Social Justice uh, as a, an abolition campaign fellow. Um, I've worked on campaigns with Salvation and Social Justice and, and prior to that with New Jersey Prison Justice Watch to, um, to end isolated confinement in New Jersey, um, to beef up and bolster the office of the corrections ombudsperson uh, so that it can provide meaningful oversight. <clears throat> and then um, the public health emergency credits bill that released, I think it was like 8,000 people um, over the past two years during the pandemic. I will just say also, um, in a really uh, maybe complimentary way, I'm here also representing religion, um, but, but not in the way that, um, that can claim any kind of triumph in this space. I grew up in a, <clears throat> a tradition that was really sort of the legacy of the muscular Christianity Wild West white supremacist uh, tradition that in so many ways um, creates this propaganda machine about who is grievable and who is savable and so when I went to seminary I it was it was under the tutelage not not directly but under the tutelage of uh, folks like Mumia Abu Jamal and Angela Davis, um, and Sundiata Akoli, um, and Asada Shakur, that taught me things about my own faith um, and what it means to um, be an abolitionist within, within a particular kind of tradition and trying to leverage a certain kind of power. Um, I do not have that figured out at all, and I'm just sort of kind of humbled to be on this panel with people that have taught me so much more um, than I could teach, so, um, yeah, that's mine. Good evening, I'm, um, I'm Boris Franklin. Um, I'm a returning citizen. I served 11 years um, in prison. Um, and I'm also a Rutgers alum through uh, the Project MVC, uh, the New Jersey Step. Um, also studied diversity and inclusion as an intern at Princeton University. I'm a visiting fellow for the Global Center for the Advanced Studies, um, actor, author, playwright, and uh, community organizer with uh, Jersey City Together, New Jersey Together. And I guess the win for me of being here is, is that I get to organize and advocate through all these different mediums that are at my disposal. But my biggest, biggest, probably the proudest moment today is that I've actually worked with everyone on this panel in some capacity to get some, some, some real things done. So thank you for having me. I'm Anton Henshaw. Um, I served 100% of a 30 year to life sentence here in the state of New Jersey. Um, like uh, my distinguished members on this panel, um, <clears throat> my abolition was formed through my grandmother and my great-grandmother. And 
by the time I got to uh, Trenton State Prison, um, some wonderful people saw something in me and began to um, invest in me and what uh, Dr. Russ would say, they began to pour into me and they led to um, my abolitionist leanings. Um, I'm a new entry opportunity specialist for Camden County, something that we created when we came home because there was no resources and nothing that we could access. Um, I left in 1988, I came home in 2018. The world was entirely different, right? There was no internet, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, right? Um, filling out a, 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 a job application, noun is online. How do you fill out a job application and you don't even understand what online is? So we created our own company with our executive director, Mr. Ibrahim Sudamani, who came home months of, like a month before me um, from Transformative Justice Initiative and in which we created a consulting company. Um, we also, um, while inside, um, we fought to bring back education when they ended the Pell Grants in the 90s. So um, I'm one of the progenitors or the co-founders of bringing NJ Step to fruition long before we got to this point. And now that we're here, right, this is a wonderful thing. It's the power, the power of manifestation of how we got here. Um, I'm also a lead credible messenger for New Jersey. Um, just recently, I didn't even open up the box, that's how crazy it is. It was recognized for a national award for credible messaging and I just posted it yesterday. And, but, for my brothers and my sisters that sit on this panel, Brother Ibrahim, none of this would be possible if we weren't able to build community inside, to bring it outside, to share. Uh, good afternoon, all. My name is Ron Pierce. Uh, I am a student, and I'm, I'm very humbled to be able to sit on this panel with all of these esteemed people that, that I have learned from over the course of my life. I spent 30 years, eight months, and 14 days in uh, the carceral system. I, um, I graduated uh, from Rutgers in my, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I graduated Rutgers in 2018 with my bachelor's degree. I am currently in the I have one more. I have one more year for my master's degree, and I'll be completed my master's degree in criminology. I work for the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice as a policy analyst. I have been involved in in the struggle for for the the humanity and and dignity of incarcerated people and, and people with with criminal convictions since before I got out even though I didn't understand how I was going to do that. The, the, the blessings that I received from, from Tone and, and from others on this panel to, to help me get to this space means that if I don't pay it forward, then I'm, I'm the, the hypocrite that, that decided to take advantage of life. And I, I won't be that. So my, my story is I am here to, to be a student and learn every single day how I can be, be better at changing the narrative of, of this society's patriarchal, white supremacist ideology thinking. And that's my story. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. <laughs> Thank you for those introductions, and I think now you may have a little idea of who it is you're going to be hearing from uh, today, but I want to jump right in and seize the time, and uh, I want to start with uh, this question, and so this is for all of you. Uh, we are, we're talking about um, our sister. We're talking about Angela, and we're talking about a black woman uh, during a time when racial tensions were just on fire. And some of us were there and others weren't, right? But, but we have those uh, 
images etched in our minds. And, and as we have walked through the exhibit, we, we, we now have new images of just what uh, Angela was going through. And so I think about the movements that, that came out of freeing her. And, and so I think about, um, you know, what does the movement look like? How do we define that, right? And, and so I, I just wanna ask each one of you, how do we uh, define a movement? And I'll start with you. Well, <clears throat> thanks. Um, I'll start this off by saying that um, no one individual can start a movement. Right. Um, I believe there's simultaneous thing, simultaneously there are things happening at the same time, you know, um, at critical points, in critical moments in time. You know, um, with Angela, you know, for me it was like, what did she do while she was in that carceral space? Right. Um, and who was she when she came out of that space? And I can identify with that because it's like, yo, who did she reimagine herself to be? Reinvent herself to be, right? You know, we talk, we talk about all the movements, you know, that were started because of her, but what about the movement with her, right? And what did she do when she got out? Right? She began teaching, right? So that's what it takes. Right? A proper education, right? The lived experience. Those are the people that have to lead these movements. Right? Those that have suffered. Those that have been traumatized. Angela had firsthand knowledge of what was going on because she lived it. You know. Um, so when we're talking about a movement. What is a movement born out of? Suffering. Mm -hmm. Suffering. Mm -hmm. And so how many movements have died or been burnt out? You know, we want a major, we want a, we want a, a small battle. But the suffering still goes on. Suffering never ended. Racism never ended. Slavery never ended. I really don't have much at all to add to that. Um, I, I think I really appreciate the way you laid it out. The only piece that I that I think I I can add in this in this theme of of seize the time, I think reflecting on Angela Davis and echoing my brother, she did exactly that. In the in a religious space, we talk about what. One of my mentors taught me is seeing the, the kairos moment, mm -hmm. you know, from the Greek in, in, in the Christian scriptures talks about in, in, this, in this season, in this time where it, the time is pregnant, it is the perfect time to give birth to something where everything is aligned, the agony, the suffering, of the people along with various prophetic figures of which Angela Davis is. The prophet in the truest form is not one that seeks a role or position or power. Prophet is one at best that is a servant to the lived experience and the people and prophets emerge as merely those that articulate the suffering and directs attention towards the people. And what Angela Davis embodies 
is a, a prophetic figure <coughs> who by any normal circumstance would not end up in the situation that she did if it was merely based on education status. She ends up there because she's black and she's a prophetic witness and then is pulled into the lived experience. I think what's fascinating about Angela Davis is that she would be the first to say that so many has suffered so much more and that she ends up in this space to get a taste of what the carceral system is like and then therefore becomes a voice and continuously tries to deflect the attention from herself and move it towards all kinds of political prisoners and the carceral state. Understanding that when that is done, when the prophetic witness is at its best, that it becomes in service to the people. And therefore, she even uses her privilege of education, power, and all of these things to help fuel a movement which in very real ways still lives on today, which we all here are witnesses to because we all are part of that. We, we all are still vestiges of that movement of which she was a part because she sees the time in her time. She heard the call of the ancestors before her and it is up to us to do the same to be progenitors of the movement. I don't know who is responsible for putting me after these guys. You know, you know? All right. That would be me. Uh, so, <laughs> I, you know, this, this is all, the Kairos movement and the, and the suffering. I, the, the, thing, the only thing that I would add to this that I can speak in any way meaningfully to is so there's the there's this Angela Davis quote that comes to mind that I always botch every time but you can look it up in abolition democracy <laughs> but it's something like no win is ever a victory unto itself it's never finished but with every victory opens up a brand new terrain for struggle right it's like new terrains for struggle um, and as I'm hearing, like, what does it mean to take a, to, to take a moment and, and live in it into a, a movement or like sort of lean into a movement? Uh, the thing that, that comes to mind is what we just heard actually in the introductions to this panel. It's, it's that we, we create family in these spaces. The, there's no way to keep struggling and struggling and struggling and struggling without the presence of, of compassionate, beloved community that enters into these spaces where we, you know, so one, one person that I really respect said this, suffering begs compassion. And I think that when you look out in the world and you see, com you see suffering, there's a certain kind of impulse, an instinct, that unless you're ready to really feed that instinct, you might just look away, because you're like, this is just too intense. But if, you are in, if you're working and living in a space of, of um, compassion and love, um, and you're willing to sort of be formed by those who have struggled and overcome, um, there's a certain kind of longevity that that, that buys you, um, because you because you it's not just like you're working, it's because you live and you love, and you've seen you've gotten a taste of what like the beloved community looks like, um, absent all of these horrific death dealing things. So, and I think that Angela Davis would also say, you know, that part partly, yes, like some some people have suffered more, but that she really gave herself to the community of those who suffered and struggled. Um, and it wasn't just from like an outside perspective, although she was so many things to so many people. Um, 
yeah, that's I guess the only thing I would add, you know, to the suffering, to the um, to the willingness to respond, is just the the intentional building of community within these struggling efforts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Emerson. Thank you for the question, Nafisa. Um, something I never thought about. So, um, but as as I'm listening to the panelists speak. I'm, I'm thinking, wow, this, this is a big question. And as far as I was concerned, that uh, a movement would be a, a collective reaction to an unjust, undemocratic, immoral, oppressive practice. And, and I would imagine that Angela Davis, you know, as she talked when we went to see her speak, she said, can't believe that 50 years later I'm still actually at this, <laughs> you know, you'd have think we had put this to bed by now. However, there are people who are just as equally invested in returning things to the status quo as we are to changing them, which is why we must consistently and persistently build power if we are to stay in the fight at all. But um, these practices do not stand in isolation. They operate in concert with other oppressive practices we call them systems that want to maintain their position, their status, and above all, they want to maintain power. There is an obsession with power, right? Uh, we recently did things on race, power, and production, and how they all tie tie into one, one system, right? How um, schools uh, actually contribute to mass incarceration, right? And just getting a taste of the Durkheim theory to understand that we have good schools because someone had good jobs, they paid taxes that made better schools so those kids could have good jobs so they could pay taxes, there's a system. And there's also a system below the poverty line that consists as well, where you see most people usually die in the class they were born in. That was constructed by uh, individuals who, who want to maintain that status quo. But, um, and you know, so the moments in the movement when you're seizing the time will be consistent to what uh, as an organizer I might consider low hanging fruit, things we could tackle now or things that we have to prioritize. Because individuals who have fought the system, as I said, we've all worked collectively on different matters. It was brilliant with uh, the doctor had said earlier where sometimes we move apart to work on separate things. Somebody might be concerned with social justice at this time and then someone might be concerned with moving legislation. But then without those brothers and sisters who are on the ground to make sure that those policies play out, then it, it really has no teeth, mm -hmm. you know, because we just did the fair chance in housing, which was, which was a great, a great uh, bill. In fact, I signed it. But um, still, Tone sent sent me something just yesterday with someone who was denied, and we knew that that law went into effect, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, what I mean? so, so if you don't have everyone working in concert to take down a system that works in concert, it's like playing a five-on-one basketball game. Mm -hmm. You just it's just gonna be almost impossible for you to win. So, so, so the movement again for me is a collective reaction to an unjust, undemocratic, immoral, oppressive practices. And uh, I'm glad to be a part of a movement. Thank you. A movement for me is my great grandmother, Lucille Henshaw, and my grandmother, Lucille Henshaw and Hardin. When I was introduced to Angela Davis, my, my grandmothers had that fair skin, that hair, those afros and things like that. And they, they came up through during the same times that Angela Davis. And I used to hate wearing those dashikis and that red, black and green as a little kid because I didn't understand it. I hated every Saturday morning Right before I could go skating or bowling or to the arcade, I had to practice my Swahili. I didn't understand until I got to the carceral space and I heard a conversation in Swahili and I responded. And they asked me, the brothers that were in the prison yard, how do you know our words? And I assumed that everybody grandmother and great-grandmother taught them Swahili. I thought everybody's grandmother 
and great grandmother taught them their culture. It wasn't until I got to the carceral space that I realized that, uh uh, right? But they came from a movement in Philadelphia that I wasn't aware of until I got to a space where there was a new movement inside the carceral space where our people began to identify and take on their culture and take on their languages and things like that and began to empower themselves to throw off the yokes of oppression. I sit here today as an open act of rebellion of everything that the state of New Jersey tried to produce in me. I am not here by their grace. I am here despite what they tried to create. They tried to destroy me. And every one of my other brothers and sisters that went through that system. Our presence here in our community with every last one of you is a testament to that movement of not breaking, not bending, not yielding, not giving up. So a couple of a couple of the, before me said something that Miss Marcy, who's one of our lead credible messengers in Camden, she talks about real relationships when it comes to a movement. We were able to build to this moment with real relationships to get here right now. Because one, we saw ourselves as a community. Two, we loved each other. And three, the biggest thing that they did was allow education to come inside that carceral space so we could learn about the structural violence of systems and how to undo them. So now, here they come. 2022, can you help us undo what we've done? And everybody that, you know, when I met Reverend Boyer, when I came home, we had the state house. I met Amos on that same van ride over to New York, what, a week after I came home? Not knowing, I knew this was a movement, but I moved on faith that I am where I'm supposed to be with the right people and developing the right, right relationships <clears throat> to get to 2022 and what we're doing. Well, thank you. A Angela, Angela Davis, from all I've read about her, says she, part of, of understanding uh, and, and living while she was incarcerated, she started to understand the nature of, of incarceration and she started to fight in that movement. But what, what I heard earlier when you were talking with the, the doctor earlier, you had asked the question, are we in a moment or are we in a movement? I don't think they're separate and apart from each other. I believe every moment is a greater part of the same movement. And, and I, I'll, I'll start with it when Phyllis Wheatley was doing poetry as an enslaved black girl in, in Boston, right? She had to write and everything had to go through her enslaver's viewpoint. So her picture was a picture with, with a ring around it with her enslaver's name in it, saying that what I'm saying has to go through him so what I'm going to say may not sound like my own words, but what I'm trying to tell you is I'm a complex human being who, who has to say what she has to say to be able to show you that I can write words that are poetry. That, that, and then as she was able to, to become more and more famous, she became more and more able to say a little bit more, but she still had to go through that filter when, when, and that, that was part of a movement to show that, that black bodies are not inferior. Then you have the, the slave narratives, which I was so glad that, that 
professor brought in and started teaching us about slave narratives. Every one of them slave narratives was trying to take the abstract inferiority and show the humanity of black people. That was the same movement as when, when uh, James Baldwin writes in, in uh, uh, Invisible Man about the grandfather showing the, 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 the grand, his grandson that you could be in a fight and still be looking like you're, you're, you're saying yes to, to this person because you have to get to understand what this person is doing so that you can defeat him. That was the same movement of, of trying to get, and, and he uses this to get his college education to fight further. So he, it's the same movement, but each of these are moments in the movement Right? The same thing in the 60s and, and the, the late 50s and the 60s, we had moments to get the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. These were movement, moments in the, the movement to advance the, the cause of black liberation. The, the, the movements of the 60s, and all of this is ebb and flow, as you know ebb and flow because at times the movement gets stronger and at times the, the other side is able to kick back a little bit. So the movement is always the movement, but the moments are just advances within the same movement. When, when uh, Black Lives Matter was able to, to come out uh, of and, and s start saying, here we are, then this is what you have, this is who we are. Right, we are this. We are the people that that you keep trying to to put down. But we are the same people that you need to 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 do everything that you've been doing. Everything that that America has, right? You can see through the different struggles. You can see the advancement of our music. It's not because white people had such great rhythm. I could get. I can guarantee you that. You know, because I can't, I can't dance and without stepping on my wife's toes, you know, and, and she'll attest to that, you know. But, but my, my point is the movement is the movement throughout the history. There are many moments within the movement. So I don't agree that, that the movement is cliche. I believe that the movement is, is structured right now at a point right now that it can actually topple certain systems, but we must not be con continually in our mindset that they're not gonna push back. Mm -hmm. There is going to be always pushback, push and struggle, uh, which is why, as Angela Davis would tell us, right, to, to live in a movement, you must live in struggle. And, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Wow, thank you. Uh, I think I think Amos wants to add to that. It just it was uh, so it, it it really inspired me to to add one more thing that just sort of feels like it it it's true that didn't get said. A, a movement has to be really threatening. Like a movement has to make people in power feel really scared, and and that's something that uh, just from from all of our collective experiences we've had these moments where, you know, um, I'm just going to give an example. Uh, during the public health emergency credits bill, which nobody said we would be able to pass, mm -hmm. to get people out of prison, ir irrespective to their, uh, their criminal conviction, aside from three carve-outs that happened right at the end, and, and Tone could talk to you about <laughs> really, really well about that. But let me just say, at the very beginning, we were on calls with legislators saying, New Jersey has the highest death rate to COVID-19. Does nobody care? Are we just going to allow this to continue to happen? We are outpacing every other state, including Nor uh, New York, California. I mean, the amount of people, the sheer amount of people that were dying in prison was, was arresting, was, it was scary. And I was on a phone call, I was on several phone calls with Reverend Boyer and a uh, few other people, ACLU and, and uh, these legislators, these legislators that we've worked with before. And there was immense resistance until, I know you, you remember this, Reverend Boyer said very plainly to this person, said, listen, 
if you believe that black lives matter, you will support this bill because prisoner lives matter too. And the person was totally silent for a second and totally turned and said, you know, I want to take a look at this again. And that's what I mean by the, the movement itself provides the cover to threaten people to either align with it or to betray it. And I think that that's kind of what Ron was saying a little bit, just like this, it's, it's all part of this bigger movement, but if we're not going to leverage the movement and weaponize the movement to create real fear in the hearts of people that have the potential to make choices, um, then the movement becomes just sort of like a, a cliche meme-worthy thing, right? Um, and it's shallow, but we can, you can leverage a movement for major moments uh, of change. If, if I may? Yeah. It seems like we like this question. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm, I'm the rogue. I'm the, the, you know, I'm the hard to work with guy in the movement, right? Yeah. Because I don't make people who oppress people comfortable, and they shouldn't be. And if you're in this movement and you want this to be comfortable, well, I'm going to tell you, 30 years in prison was not comfortable, right? Watching my friends die after I came home was not comfortable. When I'm sitting in my apartment and I'm crying because I can't do anything for them because I grew up with them. And then I'm on calls with Reverend Boyer, Reverend Amos, and I'm saying, like I'm having a meltdown and I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do and this is triggering me. I'd rather go back and go in there and fight than stand out here and do nothing. We can't be comfortable when people are dying. We can't let their deaths go in vain. And the, for me in the movement, it is to stir up and to get people motivated and, and really put forth what's actually happening on the ground. And it's multifaceted. But one of the biggest things that for me that the movement has out here is that I've been blessed to be around people who are truly in service of the movement and not for profit. I'm not saying that there isn't people that are in the movement that aren't that way. But when those people are in the room with me, Everybody on this panel will tell you, I make them 100% uncomfortable, <laughs> right? Because I don't believe profit before people. I believe people before profit. The money will come. You don't have to worry about it. Your service, when I sit at a table, they didn't let us at the table, me and Ibrahim. They wouldn't let Ibrahim Sudamani, the executive director of TJI, they wouldn't let us in a room. Cool, no problem. We built our own table, right? We fixed our own food. We established our own house. And my, 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 in three years, look at what's happening. Can you come and talk? So it's about how we service one another and how we build that community of service that demonstrates our love and our commitment. We are not here to apologize to any oppressor that oppresses our people wherever we find them. We are here, it's over with, you gotta go. I'm not asking for you to change. I'm asking for you to transform. Thank you. Well, I, um, I'm glad that you, uh, you segued me into the next question, uh, Anton. And so what that question is, is um, how do you uh, translate your current work into the movement? You talk about you know, providing service for our people. But one thing that we do know, we cannot just say, this is what our people needs. We have to be able to you know, relate, listen, and, and hear it from them. And, and so I, I ask you, um, especially those of us who are organizers, you know, what are we listening to? And, and how does our work um, allow us to move uh, in, in the way of uh, what the people uh, need, the services they're actually saying that they need? Um, first, I'll say I just want everybody to know how important Ibrahim Suleimani and um, Tone Henshaw is to me because even while I was in my carceral space, um, 
you know, transforming the justice initiative, like, I'm gonna tell you what this, the movement is about, right? It's about humanizing, right? It's about humanizing, right? So while I was still inside, right, they took out their time to go to my house to check on my family, right? So with the movement, you need buy-in, right? If I know you care about me, and you care about what I care about, right? I'm buying into you. You're real to me. You're authentic to me. Right? So when I came home, of course, they met me at the gate. Right? You know, and these just aren't service providers. These are my friends. Right? These are discussions that we had while we were in these carceral spaces. Right? So it was just amazing how when we came out, like, all of this stuff is coming to fruition. Right? So out of Transformative Justice Initiative, right? and it's just an initiative, right? check out the movement. Right? It's not meant just to be, it's supposed to go beyond just an initiative. Right? So when I came out and I started thinking, you know, we always talked about what's going to happen when I get out. And, you know, to Nafisa's point, you know, we're talking about leadership. Right? Leadership being able to listen to what the people are saying. The needs of the people. Right? So out of Transformative Justice Initiative came uh, Transformative Leadership. So my work is that I go around and I talk to leaders and I help them understand the population that they're serving. Right? I try to bridge the disconnect. You know, so currently because of Transformative Justice Initiative, now there exists transformative leadership, right? I, I across disciplines, I sit down with different leaders, right, and I try to help them understand, right, trauma. Right? I try to help them therapists. I try, therapists come and they ask. Why can't I get through to this guy, or this girl, or this man, or this woman, right? So we make a distinction that there's no, you know, there's at-risk youth, but there's also at-risk adults, mm -hmm. right? So the willingness is, you know, people saying, look, I don't know. And when you say you don't know, right, that's when transformative justice initiative can come in, when leadership can come in, and we can sit at the table and we can begin to point out, like, this is what you're missing, right? And I can speak to that. Right, because I'm one of them. Right? You can't come and tell me what you think I need. You can't even give me what you want me to have because everyone that gets out has a different need, is at a different place. Right? And you have to be able to identify, and, and, and to identify it, you have to be willing to say, first, I don't know. I don't know how to serve mm. in this capacity. Right? I don't know what I'm doing. Nobody wants to say I don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. right? It's embarrassing especially for a lot of us that are educated. It's hard for us to say, look, I don't know the answer to this, mm. right? But when you say you don't know something, that's the beginning of something miraculous. Mm. Mm. So we sit down and we, and we talk to leaders and we say, hey, look at it from this perspective, look at it through this lens. And then they'll come back and they'll say, wow, how did you know? I know because I did 32 years in this space. I know the language of my people. I know the suffering of my people, right? So if you're willing to say, look, I don't know and I'm willing to learn, right? that's all part of the movement too. We can get so that the, the, the moderator has a mic. I'll, I get uh, the community mic back. Yeah, because I, <laughs> I don't think we're using this one, so I'll just. <laughs> um, I feel so, I'm just, I feel so unqualified to be in this space. Um, you know, with everyone on this panel that I appreciate so much that I pray for, um, and that have just been so major inspirations to me, so I just want to say that. Um, I also want to say, I think it's really interesting that I'm the only black person on this panel that wasn't incarcerated. Well. It says volumes about what the situation is for us. And it wasn't for lack of trying. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be clear. Because I sure enough spent a lot of time in holding cells, but I, it's only the grace of God that I wasn't incarcerated. 
I grew up in poverty in New Jersey, and there were sure enough a lot of attempts. Uh, somehow or another, uh, I'm not going to go into the details, I'm going to answer your question, but somehow or another, my... Uh, <laughs> I was waiting for a good story. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm not going to go in too deep, but uh, it, it was only the grace of God, and somehow my father, uh, Vietnam veteran, dealing with PS, P, PTSD, that's a whole story, mustered up enough money to get me a lawyer to keep me out. And we have a system that's all about how much money you have. And we were poor. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he basically had to mortgage away a lot of his, that's the only thing that kept me out. Mm -hmm. Anyway, to your question. Police and prisons is white society's plan and response to us. As we're talking about movement, part of the movement must be us creating alternative systems and responses to and for ourselves. One of the reasons I remain, people would always say, well, you don't mean black, do you? You mean everybody. Or people would say, mm -hmm. well, you don't mean the black church, right? Because isn't heaven supposed to be everybody? I said, no, I mean the black church. <laughs> no, I'm black faith rooted. No, I, I'm, I'm never going to be part of a multiracial church. No, this is a black church. And it doesn't mean other folks can't come, but know where you're coming when you get here. <laughs> Salvation and social justice is rooted in this principle, the hope and resiliency of black faith. We were rejected mm -hmm. by white people who called themselves Christians. We made our own. African Methodism, the black church as a whole, it ain't perfect, but it's ours. We don't have to ask any white person permission to do anything. Our communities must learn from that. We built our own schools. They struggle, but they're ours. We build our own churches. A lot of them are falling down, but they're ours. We built our own religion. We must create alternatives. At some point, we need systems where white men with guns aren't even welcome in our communities. We need to show up when one of our young people are in crisis. We need to stop asking white people to teach our history to our children. Can you imagine folks who've been devastated by folks to ask the folks who devastated them to teach them their history? I just want us to soak that in for a little while. We need to create alternative models and systems and spaces and communities where anyone who wants to profit off our bodies is not welcome. And when we're talking about the movement, movements, oftentimes people, when you study movements, they sometimes get stifled by institutional maintenance. The NAACP in some ways was a movement, but got stifled, right, part of a movement, and then we talk about these things. But you need institutions and infrastructure if different portions of the movement are ever mature enough to create alternative systems. And so I encourage us that as we think about all these things, even our nonprofits, 
we got to stop outsourcing racial justice to white institutions. <clears throat> we, black people, are directly impacted, which means we all have value and power. And we must, that's why I respect Anton, New Jersey Prison Justice Watch. Because the directly impact to say, you know what, we're going to make our own. That's the prayer, the hope, the resiliency, and the example that I pray that the black church gives and that the black church reacquaints itself with. Because mm -hmm. God knows that uh, in the past few decades, we've certainly been co-opted by white colonial terroristic religion. Mm -hmm. And I pray that we go back to liberation and black freedom faith. That's my two cents. Thank you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fitting time for the white pastor then to jump in. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, so. I'll just say this. I'll just say this. We all have work to do. We all have work to do. I'll give you an example. Um, so the, um, the, the sort of settler colonial model of white supremacy is still so, so present. I mean, everywhere. What Reverend Boyer is saying about these opportunistic um, service provider models, power structures, ways that people are being served, the vetting process for who deserves housing. Uh, yeah, I live in a town where, that loves to self-congratulate, <laughs> loves to congratulate itself on being open and inclusive and diverse. And they're not asking, who doesn't feel safe here? Who doesn't feel safe here? And if they did ask it, nobody would talk to them because they don't care who doesn't feel safe. They are so much more interested in how do we create a bastion of liberal, uh, I don't know, affluence, right? Wh where, where it's sort of like this, you have these like representatives. I won't throw my community under the bus because we're working so, so hard <laughs> with them. But here's an example. So our, our church uh, gets a lot of pushback because what we are is not just a like, multicultural church. We are a church that is open all the time. We have an affordable housing corporation headquartered in it. We have a refugee resettlement program headquartered in it. We have a, we have a victims of human trafficking uh, program headquartered in it. We have a, a, a community... Uh, Prison, uh, a jail reentry services headquartered in it. We have an English as a second language uh, classes operating every single day. We have a, a cafe staffed by refugees. I'm not saying this. I'm not saying any of these things as a way of, of puffing up the reputation of our church. The, what I'm saying is that we have so much work to do, all of us, to say if we do believe in some sort of eschatological um, like end game that is that's full of love that's absent of violence that is that doesn't happen it doesn't just happen at all on its own so when we in 2017 were providing sanctuary to nine uh, victims of the immigration and customs enforcement apparatus and we were housing them we were harboring them illegally but claiming sanctuary, which is sort of like this, you know, this, this, this practice that existed before the United States existed. And we said we are, we're not hiding these people, we're highlighting these people. We're highlighting the, the, the trauma that, this, that our, our country and our state are, are willing to just sort of do to these families. When that happened, I got a phone call that there was Immigration and Customs Enforcement having coffee at a local coffee shop. And so, I went there, I asked them their names, and I told them that I was gonna sit down at the table right next to them until they left the town. And I followed them in my car until they left the, the town. Again, not saying this as a way of saying, 
you know, look at what I did. What I'm trying to say is that I know I could have been arrested for that kind of behavior. You know, I mean, I could have been. I, I was sort of leaning into my white male pastor privilege in doing it. But what I'm trying, what my point is that every single one of us has the opportunity to stand in front of death dealing power structures and say, absolutely not. Not here. This is my community. If you, if you plan to wear a gun and you plan to just sort of come into my sanctuary, I don't care if you're an undercover cop and I, I really don't care what your motives are. You leave, you, you cannot come here. You cannot come and sit in this, in this sanctuary if you are going to be a part of a death dealing apparatus that ultimately has in its crosshairs every black and brown person and every poor person that you, you can just completely marginalize. So how do we incorporate the work? We have to be vigilant. We have to be unafraid to, to sit down um, and, and monitor uh, how, the, how the money, how the violence is just sort of finding itself into our, our communities. And I just saw one of my favorite people come in and sit in the back who's part of our church. Elmira, good to see you. Thank you. Oh. There's a lot going on. <laughs> this is a tough panel to be on. <laughs> There's a lot of brilliance up here. There's a lot of brilliance up here. As a lifetime learner, this is uh, especially a treat for myself uh, to, to, be, to be up here with some of these brilliant minds and voices. Um, and the good thing is I'm in, I'm in conversation with, the, with a lot of these individuals on a regular basis. So, uh, we get a chance to do this, just not in front of an audience. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want y'all to see how many times I've been outclassed. <laughs> but I will say this, I was, uh, you know, as a person who's been directly impacted, I agree with so much of, of what the, uh, the Reverend has said, both, both in fact. Um, and um, me and Afisa were talking the other day, and we were just talking about the system. And, you know, there's been a lot of, reform and restructure and we were talking about when something is baked into the cake and I had never talked about it in this particular way but as we talked I began to examine that phrase like baked into the cake baked into the cake uh, what if the eggs were rotten you can't put icing on the cake to make it better <laughs> <laughs> you actually got to throw that cake out <laughs> and come up with new, right. a new cake, right. right, right, so, and so I had that moment, but I only get these moments when I'm in conversation with, with people who, who share some of the visions or who are willing to, to, to dive in deeply, very, very deeply, and not afraid to discover a truth, mm. right, which is left out of our judicial system. It's no pursuit of truth. You know, sometimes even justice has a, a a perverted sense of morality attached to it. And I'm like, that's, that's not the truth, though. You know, that's based on a collection of facts that have been allowed into a courtroom. Some can be omitted. Right. And then they'll use some sort of a mathematical formula to say these facts are, are good and these facts can't go. Mm -hmm. But really what we're working with is probability and we're willing to say if we're 50% sure that based on these facts this person could have did that, let's give them life. That's a probable, <laughs> it's probability. What's a probable cause? It's such a horrible system, right? To, to, but be, so we can't allow that sort of a system to serve as justice because it's, it's just not just. And as we look at it, we see that it, it's extremely heavy handed on one population of people, right? And it's, it's, it's almost a shame that when black people want to advocate for black people, they always have to have some sort of a disclaimer. Yeah, wow. Mm -hmm. like, ah, everybody's nice, but we just want to focus on the black people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, why do we have to say everybody's nice? <laughs> I, I didn't see that when other movements came about. Yeah. There was no disclaimer. Right. Yeah. You know, when, when we had that with our Chinese brothers and sisters, they didn't need to say everybody's nice. Mm -hmm. You know, when women's movement come about, they don't have to make a disclaimer. You know, you know we, and, and we do this because we know that mm. 
the fear we will invoke into white America, not just white supremacy, but white America, who believe that it's a zero-sum game, and if we get some, they lose some. Yeah. <laughs> That's baked into the consciousness of the American. Mm -hmm. At its fundamental core, they just don't believe that, you know, whether it's moral or not, I might have to give up something if you give them something. That's at the heart of it, right? And so when you talk about how I bring my work into everything I do, I'm a living part of the movement. I react with society. That's the conversation I'm having mm -hmm. with society every day in my art and everything that I do. You know, as a, as a sociology major to study people in their environment and how we react to these systems and things of that nature. Uh, being an actor, an author, and a playwright, the things that I write about are consistent with that. To humanize families, we did the play Cage, which was born out of 25 prisoners, 28, right? Mm -hmm. 28 prisoners. We all were going back to our separate selves mm -hmm. and writing portions of the play. Mm -hmm. And they sold it together like a blanket as if we were writing in the same room, wow. right? That's why it's about, <clears throat> about us at times, because we have the same experience. And, and, you know, other people can work on other things. But there are some things that we need to work on. And, and, and you would welcome the help. I don't think in the feminist movement said no men allowed. Mm -hmm. But they definitely were concentrated on making sure that women were able to earn as much as a man in this society. And nobody was alarmed by it. But the thought of empowering black people is so fearful. People are so afraid of that. And, and I don't know if it's because of the racial history of this, um, this country, and it's not my job to figure it out for you, but you have to know at your gut reaction, when someone says black power, how do mm -hmm. you digest that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does it make you nervous? And then you should investigate that mm -hmm. as to why. Mm -hmm. It makes me nervous when I say it because I know that someone will shoot me for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know that someone will incarcerate me for that. I know that I could be Angela Davis without the lawyers mm -hmm. for my own social political views. I know that I do not have freedom of speech. I know that I have certain social liberties that this civil society has agreed to say it's okay for you to be able to do that. But when we start really raising up and making people nervous by this radical idea of equity, <laughs> <laughs> it will get dangerous. But I also make sure that I include in every story I tell a narrative that is true and committed to the truth, no matter how ugly it is. I'm not afraid of the truth. Mm -hmm. I don't need, I don't need to, to, to apologize for it. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a disclaimer for it. Mm -hmm. Black lives do not matter as much as most lives in this country. They don't. And I'm committed to the liberation of oppressed people. However, mm -hmm. I definitely got a horse in the race when it comes to black people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is a personal interest for me. Mm -hmm. And that's why I bring all of my blackness to everything that I do. Okay. Talk about it, Mr. Franklin. Okay. You raise, you raise a, a very interesting point that um, um, Dr. Nell Quest would talk about in, um, in our ethnic, um, graphic classes, ethnology classes that she would teach inside East Jersey University. And she would say, there's a difference between being white and whiteness. And I never heard that before, right? So it goes to that, that, that adage that not all white people are racist, right? But what she was saying was, there's a distinction between white people and whiteness. Whiteness is the racist stuff that we all want to fight against, right? It's not 
saying because someone does not of the same hue. My brother, he wouldn't even speak to me for three years and it wasn't because I was black <laughs> in prison, but because I was so young. I was wild, I was rambunctious. He worked out next to me for three years and never spoke a word. But when it came time for harm to happen to me, without him and I ever having a conversation, he intervened. And he stopped the harm without consulting me, but because he saw not black, a black guy, right? He saw the humanity in a young man who did not realize that he was making a mistake in a carceral space that could potentially cost him his life. He didn't do it because he was a white supremacist or he was a white man. He did it because he was a human being exercising in the white body. Entirely different. He don't know that I remember that. And my relationship with him ever since then has been this is somebody that cares about me without ever speaking a word to me. He watched my deeds. He watched what I did. He should not have to die over this. We get to the point now where as I'm in this movement and I'm doing this work and I'm, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm, I'm being introduced to all of these wonderful people. Um, does anybody know who Antonio Fernandez is? Nobody knows who Antonio Fernandez is? Now when I say his other name, you're gonna know who I'm talking about. King Tone, the leader of the Latin Kings, that's his real name, Antonio Fernandez. Same people, exactly the same people. But when we go through our trainings and we're doing our work with him and Dr. Lacey, and he began to talk about systems of oppression and how we deal with those oppression, right? So currently, we have this public safety model to address violence in the, our communities. That has never worked. No matter how much money you throw at it, it's never going to work. And then he goes to um, Paulo's book, and he extracts something that makes perfect sense. Oppression leads to aggression, which leads to violence. Public safety never addresses the oppression. It only addresses the violence and the aggression. It leaves the same thing. When I came home in 2018 that I left in 1988, the same oppression is still in the city of Camden. Nothing has changed. The buildings are built up. It's a learning center for the different colleges, but my people are still destroyed. So when we get to that place where I had another beautiful professor, Professor uh, Dr. Smith, when he came in and he started saying, yo, what if we looked at violence as a virus? And how would we treat this? You're a doctor now. What would you do? And what he did was he took everybody that was in that classroom, and most of the people on this panel was in that classroom. He began to look at violence in our cities and our communities as a public health threat and not a public safety threat. And from that moment, TJI was born. And when we came back to the community, it's like, nah, public health. I have never met or been in a community, right, that if it was healthy, it wasn't safe. I've, I'm five minutes away from Cherry Hill, if you know anything about South Jersey, right? I watch with my own eyes the investments in the public health infrastructures of their youth as opposed to in the city of Camden. Right. Then I went to Patterson, and then I went to Jersey City, then I went to Newark. I went all over the state, and I watched the deliberate disinvestment into the public health infrastructures of all of these communities, and then you wonder why they're violent. You blame the victim from the lack of investment. And I'm gonna end with this. 
80 billion a year to incarcerate. New Jersey, 1.3 billion a year to incarcerate at its height 32,000 people. We're under 8,000 and it's still 1.3 billion. I think we can repurpose that money into the public health infrastructures to all the communities to where everyone is serving a sentence, a custodial sentence, could be reinvested and repurposed in those communities as a public health initiative. And I guarantee it, I guarantee it that once we address the oppression, the aggression will go down and the violence will dissipate. Thank you. Uh, be, because I'm not sure even what the question was <laughs> <laughs> any longer, I, I'm, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll speak from what I believe it was. Okay. All right. Uh, now, I grew up in projects in Bayonne, so I grew up in, in a space that was largely black and Latina and Latino. So I grew up with, with people that, that, whose mothers would tell me the same thing that they would tell their own children. They would, they would tell other children in the community, if, if, you don't, if you don't keep acting up, I'm going to smack you in the back of the head and send you home to your mother. You know, I grew up where, where I would go to my friend Robbie's house and, and he would say, look, when you, when you come, come to the house, everything's good for you to be coming in, right? But just walk right from the, the, the door to my bedroom because my father don't really like white people. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I'm like, what did I do to him? You know, I, I, I didn't understand then as a child, but then I grew up in, in a community that treated me as a community member, nothing, nothing less. I did not, I did not ever feel o an oppression of my community. I seen my community get treated differently than they, than I got treated. I went into prison again, a carceral space where 61% uh, is is black, another 17% is Latina. Now, this this is despite the fact that more than 50% of this state, even after this latest census, is, is white. 78% is black and Latina in the carceral space. Uh, so I grew, but I, then I spent 30 years, eight months and 14 days in a space where, where I was accepted just because I was a person, not the, the color of my, my skin, was not a factor. How I acted was a factor. Uh, and and Tone, Tone talks about something I'm, I barely remember, but to, to this day, I'm here because he took the time to say, of the 10 people that I can get, get I could uh, put in the college program, I choose him as one of them. So I'm here because of him. I'm here and I'm able to, to, to do all that I try to do is because I was never treated as, as different, right? I was, I was never treated different because of the color of my skin. But people that have the same color of skin as mine, I've seen how they treat people uh, of the black community. And that infuriates me because these are my friends. These are my, my brothers, my sisters. These, these are my family. You know, so I, I get infuriated that, that this disparity is so deep. And the more I research and the more I do, the worse it, it shows me how bad it has been since 1619. This has not changed. But slowly but surely, we will fight it. To, 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 and, and I am committed to fighting to, to, to the reality of there's no way you could tell me all lives matter if you stumble on the words black lives matter. If you can't say that, then how can you say all lives matter? And, and blue lives don't exist unless you're in some foreign earth. 
Uh, what, what was the name of that, that show that had blue people? Avatar. 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 <laughs> That's the only place that there's blue people. So, so, so blue lives matter is not even a reality. All lives can't matter until you could say, as comfortable as you say all lives matter, until you could say black lives matter that comfortably, and until you could show that and not just say it, until you could act that way. And that is why the struggle will and will always continue forward and, and this movement can't be stopped. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we are going to be closing out our panel, but before I do, I do have a question. Um, and I'm gonna pose a question to each one of you individually, and if you could just probably minimize it to about like 60 seconds. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think you guys can do it. Um, but, but what I wanted to do, um, uh, Russ, if you can, because see, you're, you're not only someone who uh, experienced uh, the carceral space, you're also someone who has experienced religion. Uh, you are also a reverend. And so my, my question to you, and, and so this is gonna just wrap around uh, here. Uh, so Russ and everyone on this panel is, is my family. And, and so something wonderful, one of the wonderful things about Russ is um, his mother's cooking. <laughs> and uh, Russ has somehow uh, just adopted that trait, and he's an amazing <laughs> cook. And, and so my, my question for you, uh, my, my last question for you is, what makes uh, for a great recipe for someone who was not only a prisoner, but also a pastor? We know that a majority of our uh, prophets have you know, been incarcerated. So for you to have been on both sides, um, I would just like to know as a, as a closing remark, um, how can we tie the two in as it applies to the movement? So what's showing up for me is this, sorry, what's showing up for me is this, right? In the middle of that, it always has to be the question, right? And like the question that's also a praxis. All right, what does love look like? What does love look like? Wow. <laughs> Let that sit and marinate for a while, right? Uh, so, Rev, Reverend Boyer is, um, there are certain people that I, I have on a list of people who impress me. And not a lot of people impressed me at all. What I appreciated about Reverend Boyer was his fearlessness and his ability to come from behind the collar, uh, come from behind the pulpit and put his boots on and stand with all of us on the front lines mm -hmm. against oppression. Um, it's just amazing because when we talk about the church and we talk about the black church, we don't really get to see enough Reverend Boyers. And so Reverend Boyer, you have something that you say and it's at the end of every uh, email that I receive from you. And it is on to liberation. How powerful is that? So I would like to ask you, uh, Rev, if you can just give us uh, some meaning behind that. Hmm. Um, first, I'm going to take a little pastoral privilege real quick. <laughs> Can we give it up for Nafisa? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> she is, um, I, I just, I always praise God for you, yeah. Yeah. for your work, for your witness, <clears throat> for your ministry for your power mm -hmm. and uh, I, I just I just want to name that uh, it's on it's on till liberation um, I think it speaks for itself when we talk about movement until we 
I'll go back to one of the earlier questions. I'll sum this up real quick. I think I got 47 seconds left. <laughs> um, there is a movement that has been in existence since the beginning of humanity. Oppressed people fighting for freedom. Whether that is black people, whether that is our native brothers and sisters, whether that is women, LGBTQ+, whatever, throughout humanity. Jesus was crucified because he stood with, he was, the, the, our, our scripture teaches that he was born into an oppressed state on purpose, which means God is on our side. God is on the side of the oppressed. James Cone says God is black. Henry McNeil Turner, prior to him, said God is a Negro, basically saying that God is on the side of the oppressed. It's on to liberation. The entire, we do not reach human potential, anything, until liberation is realized for all of humanity, until this radical idea of equity is achieved. And I'll sum it up with this. One of the greatest theologians of all time Sean Combs put it this way, can't stop, won't stop. Yes, sir. Amen. <laughs> okay, well, Pastor Amos Cayley, uh, my brother, my comrade, you mentioned something earlier and I said, darn it, he's, he's taking my thunder for later because this is what I was going to you know, ask you, but, but we still have space uh, for this conversation. And so what that is, is I intentionally put our pastors, you know, on this side and our prisoners on this end. And so what makes it very so exceptional here. No? Yeah, I, I just divided you guys up a little bit. And, and so what's wonderful <laughs> is <laughs> Russell can speak to both sides, right? And, and so in speaking to both sides, um, I, I say to you, Amos, we notice when we have these movements and we, we were out and we're protesting and we're doing public demonstrations that when we look around, a lot of times we don't see a lot of black people, the people we're fighting for, mm -hmm. right? Our uh, white brothers and sisters have been there as well, right? And, and so my, my question would be, there is a such thing as a white savior complex. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to black movements, it's quite evident that that is you know, a place where we, we, we can find that type of attitude. How does one, like yourself, um, fight for prisons, right? And in prison abolition, and when we're talking about prisons, we're talking about people of color, right? Um, how, how do you, in the space that you're in, not adopt the white savior complex? That's such a good question. Thank you for that question. Um, that's, it's seductive. It's seductive to be in a place working on things that you, that you think are meaningful, that you, you develop good friendships with, and it's seductive to be like, you know what, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not white. <laughs> maybe I'm not white anymore. <clears throat> and it's just not true. I mean, th it's just not true. I, I started out this, co this conversation in a way that this new to, it's new to me to own this, and it's something that I want to own every single time, which is that I grew up in a church that was, that was just formed by this, this unthinking but like completely devout acceptance that, <clears throat> that, that, that muscular white Jesus um, supports like the the sort of ordering of society in a way that creates strong families all of it's all codified it's all it's all encoded with this racist whiteness um you know and i'm and i was formed i was formed by that space and so i believe that every time that i'm a part and one of the things that i really appreciate is that i'm i'm a fellow at salvation and social justice which is an unapologetically black faith-rooted organization. So on a regular basis, I'm in communication with people who are continually asking me to, to convert, right? To, to, to undergo a conversion experience 
into the movement. I'm, I'm like rebaptized into it all the time. And so really what my response is that, <clears throat> I mean, well, I, I do try my best to not get behind a microphone when we're doing anything that's kind of a public demonstration. I do not believe that white voices need to weigh in in these spaces at all. Um, I don't think that they need to. If I'm asked to, I'll, I'll try to set the, set, set the stage or I'll sit on a panel like this. Um, and I also think that w the, the role of a white person has to be a self-emptying kind of thing in this. And that means just sort of like identifying anything white supremacist, especially inside of our, our own selves, right? Um, wherever the defensiveness pops up, I find that to be a really great learning opportunity for me to be like, okay, why did I just get defensive there? Why did I just feel my skin prickle? Uh, I need to sit with that. I need to sit with that. I need to sit with my defensiveness. I need to learn from my defensiveness. I need to figure out how to reconvert to the struggle. And really, uh, the other thing is money. Like, <clears throat> um, <laughs> Reverend Boyer said it just a second ago that so much of the money that's going toward um, the, the creation of programs, the creation of, of policies, the, all of that stuff is going into white pockets, white, white supremacist pockets, also white systems, but also the pockets of white people, individual white people. And so like in a space where there are, or in a campaign where there is money to go around to accomplish a certain kind of goal, it is so important to me, and I continue to keep it in, in my mind, that people who are directly impacted need to be paid to do the work of organizing and need to be not just paid, but like paid as well as, they, as, as possible, right? Like they need, um, the, the movements need, need impacted people running them. Um, and I am not one of those people. So I'm just privileged to be in a space where I get to lend any kind of boots on the ground or thoughts uh, or strategies um, in, in partnership with these people. Thank you, Amos. Boris. Yeah. So uh, Boris and I have uh, been together now going on seven years. Um, we met at one of the MVC Mountain View community um, semester. It was the beginning of the semester, and so we were there and, you know, meeting and greeting, and Boris and I, um, we clicked. And uh, I believe what made us click was that little thing in us that says, hey, I got somebody I can compete with. Uh, and, and so Boris, we were going around the table and we were talking about how much time we, we, we served, right? And I think I was one of two females uh, in, in the room. And so I'm in here with all of this testosterone, this, this energy. And, and so Boris, how much time did you do? You just got to win. It doesn't matter what the subject is. I did 11 years. <laughs> he didn't say it like that that day. And, and so I said... <laughs> I said, well, you know, I did 12 years, nine months, and three days. <laughs> From that point on, this has been my rock. This has been my brother. This has been my guy. He's the man who gave me away to this wonderful man at our wedding. And so it has always been, what's next? Uh, we know that Boris is an organizer, he is an author, he's a playwright, he's, he's a teacher, he's many things. And so I ask you, when we talk about the movement, what's next, Mr. Franklin? Uh, <laughs> uh, what's next for me is always gonna be art. I, I love the art of public conversation. Everything is art to me. I see the world through those lenses of art, mm -hmm. right? Because I think the artist has a commitment to the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because an artist could take something and they can put it there and stand aside from it, right? And just let people interpret it, you know, through a clear expression. They'll come to that conclusion of a truth, right? There will be 
uh, known by all rational beings. I'm borrowing from philosophy because I love philosophy as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so what's next for me, so I'll make sure I only got 47 seconds left, uh, is, <laughs> is, 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 is my art. I, I have um, Love in the Time of Mass Incarceration is the next play that's coming out because I want to humanize individuals and show how much romance is in a letter how prisoners connect. I mean, the only person who really could probably speak to this, it's not as the only person, but uh, people who have been in the service know how it is waiting, the anticipation of that letter and how much love and romance we have for one another is on the other side of that wall, your letters. I played, I played uh, tic-tac-toe with my daughter uh, through the mail, you know, just waiting for her move to come back. And, and, you know, and then when you get a love letter and you write it and you anticipate, that letter should reach there in about two days. Mm -hmm. It'll take her a day to respond. Mm -hmm. I should be getting mm -hmm. a letter by about another two days and you're standing mm -hmm. in front of the officer mm -hmm. like, did I get an email? It's mm -hmm. like, but, but you know, that, that love that, that we had. So for next, you know, for what's next is that, to keep on humanizing people behind the walls and people who come from these poor communities. And, uh, and I'll just say that, you know, because we had a conversation that time when you met um, the woman who did Mumbiak, Jamal's yeah. book. Mm -hmm. Uh, I asked Dr. West, why were we having a conversation in Princeton, right? And he said, you have to take that conversation back to your community. And the way in which I take that conversation back to my community is because I have the cultural cadence to tap into the frequency of poor people below the poverty line. <laughs> <laughs> So that's what's next, a rap album, not just. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I got. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh, my brother Tone. There are, it was a little difficult for me to think about one thing that I wanted to uh, tap into with you because you have such a vast knowledge of you know, our, our legal system and uh, more, I, I would say more interestingly, interestingly for me, there is a, uh, a term, new entry, hmm. and it's not really spoken about enough and I would like to, to share that in this space and how would new entry look as opposed to re-entry? First, um not disparaging any reentry programs, mm -hmm. but you know, I really don't care, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Let's just be honest. Um, reentries failed us. It's a sham, it's a money grab. Always has been, always will be. So taking from our cultural center, the Anu people from ancient Kemet, all we did was drop the A. So inside Anu meant African National Ujamaa the African national family while I was in Trenton State Prison when I first got there. And they did a um, Mumia and um, something was happening in Philadelphia at the time and they had these red armbands and they marched around um, the elevator in the North Compound mm -hmm. and it was Anu. So what we did when we came, well, while I was inside, um, we just dropped the A capital N, small u, and put entry behind it. Because for everything that we were going through when Ibrahim, your husband, and I came home, everything was new and everything we learned about coming home was a lie. It was a bold-faced lie. How could I almost be homeless with $12,000 in the bank? The reason why is because reentry told me when I went through STARS, that you had to create a budget, you had money, you could do all of these things. Nobody ever taught me about verifiable income and my slave wages that I earned, those 12,000 over a 30 year period, could not be used as verifiable income in order to get housing. So what we had to do, right? Chris Agins, Thais, was use my award letter new for graduate school as collateral in order to get me an apartment to keep me from being homeless. 
pop up barriers. So when we began to create this model to, 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 to be able to demonstrate what we were able to do, right? It wasn't a person that didn't go through what we were going through that was coming home. Each one of our, our, our issues were different, but we all were suffering from the same form of oppression. So therefore, we had to distinguish of how we were gonna be in service of our community that's coming back from the current arrangement of things, and therefore, new entry. Mm -hmm. And our purpose is simply this, our service to each other and our community is our redemption. And anybody that had a problem with that, that still has a problem with that, you were with me. They invite us to dinner, they sit down and try to coax us into this stuff with money, and they ask, Anton, Ibrahim, what do you need? Nothing. We don't need anything. And I'm gonna close with this. Most of y'all can't see this, but it's, called, it's a blue pig, right? It's a blue pig. It has a coin over the top of it. That's cryptocurrency. It's ours. And we will fund new entry with our own cryptocurrency. Not asking anybody for anything. We own it. And it's the first time I revealed this because it was two years in the making. Because everything that we revealed in new entry, and you and your husband know, what did they try to do? They try to steal it. This is ours, created by us, for us. Thank you. Ron Pierce. Oh, boy. Um, Ron is one of my heroes. Ron is one of the most humble um, brothers that I have come to meet uh, in this journey. And he is a teacher and he's also a protector. And when I think about the protector in him, I think about how do we protect the integrity of social justice. Um, when we talk about social justice, it's so vast, but there is an integrity that I believe goes with it. And, and I speak about integrity because you embody that, uh, Ron. And so when we talk about maintaining the integrity of the movement, a social justice movement, uh, 60 seconds. <laughs> uh, 60 seconds. Uh, the, the integrity of the movement Huh, that's, 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 uh, you, you, I, I think Tone said it, uh, I know Boris said it, the integrity of the movement is in ownership of the movement, you know, you, you can't, you can't let money be the, the focal point of a movement, because money is a focal point of distraction, when, uh, in in the, the ancient days, they used to talk about, or Socrates used to talk about, the the shadow puppets on the wall, mm -hmm. right? The shadow puppets on the wall are the distraction. They're they're the ones that are uh, make you look over here, so they could do what they want over here, behind your back, and and so th the money itself, in in any movement especially when they start throwing large sums, right, is meant to be the distraction. And, and, and Reverend Boyer said it himself, uh, the, 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 the movement for black liberation has to be vested in the black people. And, and I can be as, as supportive and, and work as hard as I can in support of that movement but the movement for black liberation has to be led by the black people. And, and so integrity means 
Those that, that are meant to lead need to lead and not be distracted by the money. And those that are meant to be supportive should understand that being supportive is not a less than role. So that is what integrity of a movement to me means anyway. I hope I've stayed under 60 seconds. Oh, you, you, you did good, you did good. And so can we please give it up for our panelists? Thank you. Um, I'm not too sure if we have time for like maybe two questions. Um, if anyone has a question. Yes. How key would you say transparency is in the art of movement? Transparency? Yeah, we can let one person take that, can we? Um, I'll take it. So. It's very critical. Um, it's so critical that that's one of the reasons that me and Ibrahim get criticized for. Because every dollar is accounted for, every, every intention behind a decision has to be taken to the people that you're in service of. You can't, so um, with our new entry opportunity specialist for Camden County, our thing is we speak with and not for. And that's hard because that requires ultimate transparency. I'm only going to speak with the people I'm in service of. Do not call me to your panel or to your table to tell you what I think they need. I'm going to put you on the phone and say, this is what they need, and this is what they're saying, and you can get it directly from them, and, you can, and I can step back. So when we walk into these movements, right, when you're talking about budgets and plannings and things like that, if we're not having those discussions, that are open and transparent where everybody come in and, and sit down and look at the books, then you, to me, as far as the movement go, are an agent of the very oppression you claim to be fighting. Thank you. And we're going to let uh, Russell add on to that. Well, transparency is important because like, we live in a society where leadership has failed people. right? So. We, all, we, we never want to send some people um, somewhere that we're not willing to go, right? So our morality, right, that's important, right? We never want people to, uh, you know, right, uh, do what I say and not as I do, right? So we always want to be transparent to the point where, right, we're living right, right? Because how we live, will always yes. speak louder than our words. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Okay. Um, yes? <laughs> yeah. So uh, thanks everyone that was inspiring, amazing, eye-opening, jaw-dropping, you know, just thank you so much. Um, so we have the, the, the uh, galleries close at five, but I believe that uh, our guides are up there. Donna and I will be up there if anyone wants to continue any of these conversations around some art. Uh, and uh, thank you, Nafisha. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so we'll, we'll see you up there. And uh, thanks for coming. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you.